Let me ask you a question. What would you do if you found out that your real father was a king and you were from royalty? Think about that for a sec. All of a sudden you find out, wow, I'm actually from royalty. Someone in my family line was a king. He was a ruler. He directed people. He led people. He sat on the throne. You know, What would you do if you found out that you were of royalty? Would you learn how to speak like royalty? You know, kind of let me ask the question this way. One has recently discovered that one is royalty. How should one act? Should one do? Can one help one? You know, would you start speaking royalty? Would you act differently because of royalty? Ancestry magazine in 2000 announced that 60% of Americans are descendants from royalty, from Britain there. 350 descendants from British royalty migrated into America colonies in the 18th, 17th and 18th centuries. And they were the younger sons of these rich royalties. They were aristocrat families that they decided to leave because they wanted to go to the new world and make their fortune there. And so 60% of Americans are from royalty. You might be from royalty. Somewhere in Britain you might have some bloodline that's a duke. You know, or a princess or a prince. You you just never know. What an awesome concept to think about. And yet here today, we're going to see that Peter considers us to be of royalty. Because we belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That is Jesus Christ. That's how special you are to God. That he has given you special blood in a sense. Blue blood, as they say. You know, through his blood alone. Last week we looked at verses 4 through 5, and so let me read those to you very quickly. Coming to him as a living stone, Jesus uh, is that living stone that Peter speaks about that was rejected by men, but then chosen by God, and very precious. And there we get the word precious again uh, from Peter, and we're going to see the word precious again in these few chapters these few verses that we will be going through. And again, Peter's observation of his Savior is one that is precious to him. Very precious. You also, he says, our living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so we too are living stones in a sense because we belong to the living stone. And as living stones, we can offer up sacrifices unto God acceptable to him. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 that we are to offer up what? Our lives, our bodies as a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service. And so our very lives are given to God. We are to give ourselves freely to our Lord. We are to say, yes, Lord, direct me, guide me, and lead me. Yes, Lord, I love you. And yes, Lord, I'm willing to sacrifice my life for you. That is the attitude of a living stone. Towards the living stone. So today what we're going to do is look at verses 6 through 10. And we're going to talk a little bit about that chief stone. That chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. What does that mean? A living stone, a cornerstone, or even a rock. And then Peter will encourage these persecuted Christians with some encouraging words to finish up in in verses 10, 9 and 10. So let's look at verses uh, 6 through 10 and continue to read that just so we get the context of what's going on there. So he says in verse 6, Therefore, so in light of what we just read, it is also contained in scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, you to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stumbling and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were anointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now a, the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. The chief cornerstone. Peter says, therefore, so thinking about this living stone, Thinking about us being living stones and offering up sacrifices unto the Lord, Peter says, therefore, in light of that and meditating on that, it's also contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. Peter goes back to Isaiah chapter 28. I love it when the New Testament goes back to the Old Testament. Because it makes reference to the Jewish book. And it tells us today that the Jewish book was accepted by Jesus and the apostles. And they put weight, credence, evidence that is authoritative. And so we can go back to the Old Testament and read Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and all the way to Malachi or Malachi, you know, (laughs) and know that they are the books which are written by God, breathed through men. And so Peter quotes Isaiah the prophet. And Isaiah the prophet talks about this living stone, the cornerstone. You know, what does a rock represent in scriptures? When you you look at the rock or a stone and so forth, what does it really represent? A a rock can represent salvation. It can represent uh, anchor, stability, strength. But a rock can also represent judgment too because it can fall on you. It can hurt you and so forth. It can crush you. It was the rock when Moses... uh, called upon God, and God said, look, your people are are thirsty, so go and strike the rock. And he struck the rock, and water came out of the rock, and they were able to drink. You know, they found the location of that place where he struck the rock, and it's pretty amazing. We showed it here through a video at one time, and it wasn't in what they believe to be in Israel, but it was actually in Muslim country. And there's this huge rock that kind of just shoots out of the ground. And there's actually a hole in the center of the rock, as though something came out of it. And when they took an aerial view, they could see the rock in the direction it was faced, as though water was coming out. And there's this huge lake form. It's dry now, but it's huge lake form. And they estimate that that rock could have easily have quenched the thirst of one million people. I mean, you just see it, and it's just like, wow, biblical times, right there, the, the Word of God is true, this picture. And so we see the rock representing salvation, representing uh, quenching of one's thirst, and so forth. But the rock can also represent judgment. Did not Jesus say that if you make one of my little children to stumble, it would be better for you to take a millstone, Tie it around your neck and throw yourself into the water. You drown. A millstone was a round wheel with a a center hole in there. And and they would lift it up and there would be two. And they would take their olives or they take their nuts or their grain and they throw it in there. And it would crush and they would turn it with a donkey or maybe by hand. you know, And they would turn it until they crushed it into powder. That's judgment. And Jesus was very serious that us as adults, we represent Christ. And if we don't represent Christ to our children, to those around us, and we cause others to stumble and to fall and to look at Christ in a negative way, guess what? It's better for you to tie a rope around your head and throw yourself in the water. Why do you call yourself a Christian if you're not going to act like one? That's what Jesus was saying. Don't stumble others, otherwise the rock will crush you. So, so the rock, the cornerstone, what is Peter talking about here? We're going to define that a little bit more. Jesus is that precious elect cornerstone which was laid in Zion or Israel. Peter says he's the cornerstone. Zacharias has a parallel messianic prophecy regarding this cornerstone that he's talking about, declaring that from them, that is the house of Judah, whom Jehovah will take his power will come the cornerstone. So Zacharias talks about a cornerstone coming from Judah, from Israel. Again, it's speaking of a person. Isaiah 28, as I mentioned it earlier, the prophet speaks of God's word directly to the rulers of Jerusalem about this cornerstone. But they boasted that they did not need 
any cornerstone, any ruler over them because they were fine. They could handle their own trials. They can, they can find security in their own means and their own power and their own strength and so forth. Just like today. You know, today we have people that, that we witness to or share with. You know, well, I don't need God. You might need God, you know, protect you, but I don't need His protection. I can do a good job at it myself. But really? You know, I like to always, well, how are you doing with it? You know, <laughs> is it working out? And usually they'll lie. Oh, yeah, it's working out great. Are you working? No, not really. Well, I thought it was going to work out. You know, you can't. You need Christ in your life. So God said concerning their security that it was false and that this stone in Zion would be laid and would be precious and that they would be secure if they would trust and have faith in this stone. And so Peter said, Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. Then he says in the next statement, And he who believes on him, again, the cornerstone is speaking of Jesus, so that's why he says him, this cornerstone, will by no means be put to shame. If you believe on Christ, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Because you believe in the Savior, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you can stand boldly and proudly that he is your Father. And there's nothing for you to be ashamed of. You'll never go wrong putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You stand before Him unashamed. I love that. When I stand before Him on that bema seat of Christ, I can stand with my head up high. Well, wait a minute, but you've, you've kind of messed up a lot, Reuben. You, you sinned, Pastor. Yeah, we've all sinned. But when we stand there, our sins are forgiven. You know that you're washed clean because of the blood of Jesus? Your sins are forgiven, forgotten, and getting off for eternity. God remembers them no more. And when you stand before Him, you can stand unashamed before Him. That is awesome how great the blood of Christ really is. Unashamed, unashamed. Two boys can be playing well with each other. And all of a sudden, you know, boys, they start to fight, right? Little scuffle. Pull a little hair, a little ear. They're on the ground. They're getting dirty. All of a sudden, you stop the fight. You get them together. And you go, who started it? And, of course, you have one boy standing like this, you know. And you have another boy who stands pouting posture. Who do you think started it? The one with the pouting posture, right? He's ashamed. Oh boy, I'm in trouble. I got busted. You know? The other one's just standing like this because he knows I didn't do anything wrong. It wasn't my fault. I'm not really that ashamed. Adam bit the apple, did he not? And he felt great shame that he went and he covered himself with a fig leaf, huh? Eve, too, felt the shame. He covered, she covered herself with a fig leaf, too. And she went and she hid behind some bushes. Then she tried on the maple leaf and the sycamore leaf and the... Oak leaf, too. <laughs> you know, women, they're not satisfied with the first thing they try on. <laughs> Shamefulness. Uh, we understand that feeling. The word shame means to put to shame, to humiliate, or to disgrace. Or to disgrace. If you know Christ, there's no disgrace. There's no shame whatsoever. I like uh, Weiss's phrase, It's very accurate. He says, shall positively not be disappointed when they stand before him. For who? For those who believe in him. Now notice what he says in verse 7. Therefore, so in light of what we just said, not being ashamed. Therefore, to you who believe. Now it's interesting this word belief here. It means to consider something to be true and therefore worthy to trust in. Okay? We have to understand that. It's very important that we understand what that word belief means. Because you can believe and say you believe, but you haven't put your trust into that thing. I remember a story years ago that was told about a guy who could uh, uh, balance on a little tightrope across Niagara Falls. And so he he did this for a living to make money. So he threw a tightrope across Niagara Falls. And he walked across Niagara Falls and the crowd began to come around. And of course he'd take offerings afterwards. And he walked back and forth as many times as he wanted. And then he'd get a pole and he'd walk with the pole back and forth, back and forth. Now, everybody believed that he could do it, right? If you saw someone do that, you say, yeah, I saw him do it. I believe it. Well, then he decided, well, how much do you believe that I can do this? Well, we believe you can do it. We saw you do it. Well, I'll tell you what. He grabs a wheelbarrow. And he says, you think I can take this wheelbarrow across? 
Yeah, we know you can do it. I believe it. So he takes the wheelbarrow all the way across and all the way back. You guys think I can do it again? They go, yeah. Excuse me, sir. Could you sit in the wheelbarrow? The guy goes, uh, no, I'm not going to sit in the wheelbarrow. See, you can believe, but really not trust that it's going to work. See, we have to believe, and belief has to come first. You have to have a knowledge of, of something, that is, that Jesus existed historically. We know that. Uh, we know what he teaches. He teaches that he's God. And now, a, a logical person will say, well, if he's teaching, he's God. So either he's God, or he's a lunatic, and he's crazy to say that he's God. So if he's crazy, then none of us believe. But if he said what he said, and it's true that he's God, then he is God, and he's the Savior of the world. So we can believe all that, and yet not put our faith and trust in it, right? And then we would not have salvation. The demons believe, James says, remember? And they fear and they tremble. Because they believe, they've seen him, but yet they haven't put their faith and trust in him. And so their life is doomed. Christians are to believe that he exists. All the evidence is there. And then we are to trust in him. We are to get in the wheelbarrow. As hard as that is, we're to get in it and trust that he will take care of us. He's speaking to every man and woman here, even child, that we are to have faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This is not just an understanding or even agreeing that Jesus exists. It's giving him your will. Let me make that clear. That we're to call him Lord and that means obedience to his commandments. That's what he's asking for in your life. We will see the contrast here of the believer and the unbeliever as he continues on. So, to you who believe, now he says, to you who believe, he's precious. Let me say it this way. To you, therefore, who are believers, the living stone is precious. And so he uses that word precious again. What's precious? We all understand the word precious. Peter here is going to contrast the grace of the living stone to the believer whom he's precious, with the living stone becoming to the unbeliever who refuses to allow him to become precious to them by believing and trusting in him. To an unbeliever, Jesus isn't precious. We all understand precious. You're, you're, new, you're newly wed. You get married. Nine months later, you're, you know, you're expecting. You have this precious baby. I can remember every one of my son's birth to the T. I know exactly how it took place. And I know the tears that came down our eyes. You know, when they came forth. And like my son. Crying and brown and hair all over the place. You know, and Virginia white with blonde hair all over the place. And they lay them on her chest with that blue robe, you know, that's tied behind the back and, you know, and I just, I remember every one of them crying as they came out. Crybabies, a bunch of crybabies. <laughs> that's precious to a, a newly born parent. It gets harder when they become teenagers. They're not so precious anymore. And then your grand, those of you who are grandparents now, oh, how precious those babies are. I mean, it's like, I mean, you can't be in the room. Okay, I understand that. <laughs> you know, I was in the room with my boys. I mean, I was right there with Virginia. But grandchildren are different. You can't be in the room <laughs> with them. So you're in the waiting room, and you're waiting and waiting. That's why I call it waiting room, waiting and waiting and waiting. And then finally the word comes through, and you run in there, and you're just like, it's like, hallelujah, lights are going up all over the place. And it's like, wow. And I, rem I remember Gabby, you know, coming into this world right here in Corona Regional, off of Sixth Street, you know, and just holding her, and it's like, wow, our first girl, even though it was Modesto's baby, it was our first girl, you know, and then she had a heart murmur, and they had to keep her, and like, oh no, and we were praying, and we we're so concerned because she's precious to us. She's precious. That's how Jesus ought to be to us, precious, precious in every way. One way to know if a person has truly come to faith is to see if Jesus is truly precious to them. We know Jesus to be precious. But do we believe and personally accept Him as precious? 
is He that precious? Because He is more precious than my four boys and then my granddaughters. Far more precious. He's my Savior. He's my King. He laid His life down for me and for you. He thought nothing of Himself and thought everything of you. And now Peter says, but to those who are disobedient. And this is sad. Heartbreaking. That there would be those that would not accept Jesus Christ. Oh, they'll believe. But he's not precious to them. And they won't trust in him. So they're disobedient. Unbelief is a failure to respond to God with trust. The Greek word is pistis. With trust. And a heart show not doubt, but rejection. That's what the word disobedient means. It's, I believe it, but my heart isn't really yearning for it. I'm not doubting it, but I reject it, is what it's doing. I reject it. So having a conscious understanding and even accepting the historical validity of it from scriptures, from external Evidence that's out there, archaeological evidence that's out there, the rock that I just shared with you that's out there, and so, so, so much more. And yet they say, I reject it because I want to be in control of my own life. And this guy can't even be persuaded. This person cannot be persuaded to believe in Jesus or in what he has done or what he's provided for them in the future. They totally reject it. So what's the result? He says the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And Peter is quoting Psalms 118 here, which they would sing during Passover. This stone they rejected. And so he's become the chief cornerstone. Rejected here means to reject as a result of examination and testing of one's qualification for an office. And so after examining it, thinking about it, contemplating it, even Seeing the evidence, yet they have rejected that evidence. What is the cornerstone? It's the first stone laid when building a temple. It's the supportive stone. It's the stone that holds everything together. And that's why they call it the chief cornerstone. In 1 Kings 6, 7, It actually talks about this cornerstone which was constructed for the building of the temple. It says the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer or axe or tool or iron heard in the house while it was in the building. So this stone that they would build, they build it in the quarry. And they would build these stones exact measurement. And they would take these stones from the quarry and they would transport them miles and miles and miles away into Jerusalem and they would fit exactly in the right location because they they measured them to exact. You go there today, the stones are still there. They don't use mortar. And these stones, some of these stones are as, the the length of the stone is the length of this whole building and probably as high as the the, the rail there, the chair rail on the the wall, that's high. How do you transport a, a limestone that heavy miles away. They still haven't figured it out. And every stone that they quarry outside because they couldn't allow noise because this is where they felt God dwelt. When God shouldn't hear anything, we should just bring it in and let it stand. And no mortar and stone upon stone. You can't even get a, a paper in between the, the grooves there. Pretty amazing. And so they would take this chief cornerstone which held everything else up and it sat in there perfectly and held the whole building together. Jesus is that cornerstone. He holds everything together. All other stones are placed upon Him. He is the foundation that holds everything together. You know, Jesus even holds the universe together, the earth together, and everything that is around us because He is truly the chief cornerstone. He is the support and power that rests upon us. So Peter says in verse 8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now remember the context. He's speaking to the unbelief, those unbelievers, right? So this stone is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Interesting stumbling. 
We have all done this stumbling. I remember as a little kid, we used to run around with the, without our shoes, and my mom would always say, "Get your shoes on." Of course, then we'd come home, and our big toe would be bloody. The nail would fall off because you end up stumbling or scratching on asphalt or something like that. You know, remember that? I know I did. That's what the word stumbling means, is that there's this stone in the path and you end up striking it or dashing it with your foot or your leg and you end up stumbling all over the place. That chief cornerstone to the unbeliever becomes a stumbling block. Matthew 21, 44 says, whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls... It will grind him to powder. Remember what we spoke about, what the rocks represented. Whoever falls on this stone, in other words, if you come to the stone and just fall on it and hug it, you know, beautiful. You go up to the desert. And there's huge stones out there. And it's hot. And you go in a shaded area, you go and hug a stone, guess what? It's cool. It actually feels good. You know, and you do that with the Lord. You come and you fall on him. You know, you fall on the Lord and he takes care of everything. Or, like the unbeliever, it falls on you and it crushes you to powder. So it depends on us, doesn't it? Whether we embrace it or whether we allow it to crush us. Basically, what this scripture is saying in Matthew twenty-one forty-four is it's saying that if you don't embrace it and it crushes you, you're damned eternally. He goes on and says, they stumble being disobedient to the word of God to which they also were appointed. That word appointed means destiny. Now this isn't proof of Calvinism. This isn't saying they were appointed to death. What this is saying is is teaching that they're destined to stumble. That's what he's saying there. Because the stone is going to stumble them. They're going to hit it. They'll stumble over it. And so they're destined. If you're going to stumble over it, then, you know, if you reject the stone, you will stumble. And so that's what he's saying here. So, Peter's really trying to encourage these believers that are being persecuted there by Nero and Roman citizens. It's hard times and it's devastating to watch family members die and pass away. But Peter's encouraging them, you're believers, and you have a precious Savior. And he's a stone that you can embrace and hold on to. The unbelievers, one day they'll be judged. God will come and crush them and take care of them, so hang on. So he says in verse 9, you are a chosen generation. And he's encouraging them now. He says, you're a, a, a generation, a race of people that is chosen by God. And again, we're chosen by God because we freely come to God. We make a choice to accept Him. Not only are you a chosen generation, but you're a royal priesthood there. That concept of royalty originated in Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 through 6. It says, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandments or covenant, then you shall be my own possession. Among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be a, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is God speaking to the children of Israel. If you obey my commandment, if you trust in me, then I will be your God, and you'll be my people, and you're precious, and you're holy. In fact, you are a priesthood. The word royal there, basilio, is used only here by Peter and refers to which belongs to or appointed to or is suitable for a king in other words the idea is that you are appointed god's royal priesthood god has appointed you as his royal priesthood you are all priests in the kingdom of god isn't that awesome you have good priests and you have bad priests in the kingdom of god we saw it in the books of kings some priests got into idolatry and they continued on with the customs of the world you know And they were bad priests. They were God's priests, but they were bad. But then there's the good priests who loved God and supported God and worked with God and sacrificed unto God. And Peter is saying that because Peter says to all Christians that they are priests of God, holy priests of God, who offer up sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus, verses 4 through 6. We just read it earlier, right? We offer up our sacrifices to God. 
Revelation 26 says, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection over this, these, this second death, which has no power over them. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with Him for a thousand years. So we're going to be priests, Revelation 26. Reigning and ruling with God. It's interesting that we are a sacrifice. I was watching a... Uh, documentary of the 1400s. There was a, there was these um, from Asia, this very strong nation called the Hordes, Hordes, uh, <clears throat> Asian nation, huge there in Russia, and they pretty much controlled Russia completely. They were in total control, and they were they were at Moscow, and uh, they could have taken it over, but they did not take it over. The historical this historical nation was heathen and Muslim. And it was so mighty, and we know the Muslims were very mighty back then. I mean, they were growing like crazy. Um, well, one of the leaders, the the Kongs, you know, that ruled and reigned, um, his mother became blind. And so they tried all the sorcery they could to remove the blindness. And so they decided, and at the time the Russians were believers, Christians, the uh, Coptic believers. They went to Moscow and said to the prince, the leader of Moscow, the Russians, either your head or you sent us your priest to perform magic that our mother would see. So this priest goes all the way back to the, this nation, it's huge, and he does what he only knows what to do, and that is to pray. And so he believes in the Bible and he quotes scripture. He's praying to God and doesn't know what you're doing, God, and how you're going to do this, you know. And they're fearful for their lives, but he goes in there and he prays over her. And then she, he asks, open your eyes. And she opens her eyes. Can you see? And she says, yeah, I see darkness. Okay, so he's frantically trying to think of other things. His assistant says, the Lord, remember the Lord, he grabbed mud and, and he mixed it with water. Go grab mud and mix it with water. Put it on her eyes. And so he went and did that and tried that. And they only gave him so much time. Well, that didn't work either. And so you saw his faith challenged. And so after it didn't work, they took his assistant, threw him in a dungeon. And they told him, you walk back to your land, which was thousands of miles away or hundreds of miles away. Then the leader said, I want you to follow him and let him not die. Because when he gets to his land, I want him to see what we're going to do to his nation. They were going to totally wipe it out, kill them all. Well, this priest was praying and asking God, losing his faith, really. Saying, where were you? Why didn't you help? You know, all of these questions that he had in his mind. And so he didn't want to go back to his land because he figured something like that would happen. So he stayed there. And, and <clears throat> staying there, this storm and weather changed. And with the weather changing the leaders thought judgment is coming because they had told the guy that was watching him to keep him safe. They told him, I want you to kill one of his citizens every day up until so much time and then start with three. So he saw people dying around him who were his citizens. And so the storm comes. That he decides he's going to offer himself up as a sacrifice. There's this fire and his arm gets on fire so he lets it burn. And all of a sudden he's burning completely and everyone's standing around him. And then they all realize this has got to be the priest. This has got to be the guy that they asked to come out here. They put him out of fire. He's completely burnt. And so they picked him up and they threw him out in the weather. This great storm was coming and they kept saying judgment's coming because of what we've done to him. You know, and they thought judgment was coming. And he's laying there and he's just praying and he's asking God, I don't know what I've done. I don't know what I haven't done. I'm just crying out to you. Why have you forsaken me, Lord? You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's quoting all these scriptures and saying, but I put my faith and trust in you. And then all of a sudden the storm stopped. It just stopped. And they came, they picked him up, they cleaned him off. He says, you're a great wizard. You know, you're a great wizard. You stopped the storm. You stopped judgment from coming. And their mother could see again. Now, you know, I don't know. They asked him, how did you do it? And he goes, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. But he prayed to God. But here's a man who saved pretty much Russia 
Unfortunately, Russia became bad afterwards, but during that time, he sacrificed himself for what he believed in. And God was able to bless if God was in it. You would ask him, and he said, coincidence? Who knows? I just know who I believe in. Peter says, you're a holy nation. Also, his own special people. Literally, a people for possession, acquisition, or purchase. People who belong to God. We are God's people. You are God's possession. That's hard to understand for us because we don't want to be anyone's possession. Especially a woman. I'm not his possession. Does he tell me what to do? No, you're to come alongside and be his helpmate. God possesses us. He owns us. We're his special people created for his glory. The word people here is laos a term used for Israel in the Old Testament to describe this intimate relationship with God, but now Peter is using it to describe the Christian community, that we too have a special intimate relationship with God. And you look at Israel and how intimate God uh, loves them. I mean, he has sustained them throughout all of history. The only people in the world who have been dispersed across the whole world and then all of a sudden come back together and start a nation. I mean, God is not done with them. That's a miracle in itself. You don't hear of the Jebusites or the Amorites or the Perizzites. You know, none of those guys are around anymore. But the Israelites are still around because they're God's special people. And each saint is unique to God. And he's uniquely owned by God for a specific reason. Now, why? That you may, what, proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into a marvelous light. Why? Just so you could praise him, lift him up, sing holy praises to his holy name, give him adorations. As the psalmist says, I will tell you of thy praises and in thy gate, the daughter of Zion, I will rejoice in thy salvation. My mouth shall tell of thy righteousness and thy salvation all day long, for I do not know the sum of them to praise him and to glorify him. What has God done for us? He's pulled us out of darkness and brought us into light, Peter says in verse 9. 1 John 3.14 says he pulled us out of death into life. 1 Corinthians 7.15 says he pulled us out of bondage into peace. Galatians 5.13 pulled us out of bondage to liberty. Matthew 11.28 pulled us out of labor to rest. And then he pulled us out of the pit and put us on solid ground. 2 Timothy 2.19 Someone said Jesus can change the foulest sinner into the finest saint. Only Jesus can do that. That's what Jesus has done for us. For those who believe. But those who have rejected, the stumbling stone will come upon them. Look at verse 10. Let's finish up. Who once were not a people, but now the people are the people of God. At one time you were not the people of God. At one time you were rebellious and you rejected God, but now you are the people of God. And he's quoting in Hosea 1, 9 and 10. The same phrase there. So, in other words, you were at one time didn't belong to God. But now that you have trusted him, you now are among God and his people. Who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now, I love the Greek text here. There's a nuance here. In other words, there's a subtle difference. Because it reads this way. You had not permanently receive mercy because in this world you have mercy right even if you don't believe in god there's a certain amount of mercy that you have god has mercy on you how many times did you get in big trouble and you just said god and god helped you but it's not permanent there's mercy that's available to you because god's a merciful god and he doesn't want to see you punished or separated from him for eternity and so he allows you to see glimpses of himself before you become a christian And so there's mercy there, but it's not a permanent mercy. And so Peter says, you had permanent, you have not permanently received mercy, but now you have started receiving continual mercy. That's the Greek. So as a believer, there's continual mercy in your life. And so God will continually be merciful to you, even though you get rebellious, even though you sin. And you walk your way and you turn your back. God's mercy is there because you're a believer. And and what he's doing is, he's revealing his nature, his love for you. 
and hoping that you will see how much He loves you and that you'll turn back and say, Lord, i got to come back to you. I can't live this way because I'm miserable. I'm miserable. You know, Christmas is near. And we're all getting ready for all the gifts. But there's one gift that one gift that you don't want to miss. And that gift that's in this box is mercy. And it's available. It's a big box because God is rich in mercy. And it's a continual flowing of mercy. And if you need any mercy today, then you can find it today in Him. Let me close. Let me read this to you in Luis's translation. But you, as you, you are a race chosen out, kings, priests, a set-apart nation, a people formed for God's own pleasure, in order that you might proclaim abroad the excellencies of the one who out of darkness called you into participation in the marvelous light, who at one time were not a people, but now are the people of God, who were not subjects of mercy, but now have become objects of mercy. Amen. If you would like mercy today, I want to give you an opportunity as we bow our heads to receive mercy. In our track, if you could grab our track, and I encourage you to grab it, study it, read it. On the back of it says, ask Jesus to be your Savior. It says, admit your need. I'm a sinner. You have to admit that you're a sinner. You've fallen short of God's glory. Be willing to turn from your sins. You have to say, I'm no longer going to live in sin. I turn from them. Three, believe that Jesus died for you on the cross and rose again from the grave. And then pray this. Now, as our heads are bowed and you're praying for those, if you'd like Jesus Christ into your life, I want to pray this little prayer with you. Ask Jesus into your life. Ask for His mercy. If you want Jesus in your life, just, just raise, your, raise your hand, put it up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I will pray this for you. Amen. Anybody else? Jesus died on the cross. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, I want you to just repeat this in your breath to the Lord. Just pray this. And it's in the track and you can see it afterwards. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I ask you for forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. Please give me eternal life. I want to trust you and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Father, I...